year 10 and 11. Welcome to your revision on Romeo and Juliet and the conflict, the feud in preparation for your GCSE exam. Conflict then is obviously one of the main themes within the play. It is the main problem that the characters face. Um, obviously, Romeo and Juliet, it intervenes with their relationship in many ways. There are a few important conflicts in the play. Notably, the feud, the ancient grudge, the fighting between the Montagues and the Capulets. We can't avoid that, obviously. Everyone in Verona is affected by the hate they have for each other. And obviously, the prologue is going to detail that for us when I come to that in a minute. Uh, many people throughout the play even die due to the fact that they have uh, grew up or um, been taught, I suppose, to hate one another, which we realise when the servants are fighting in Act 1, Scene 1. Again, we're going to detail that. And another obvious significant conflict is that Romeo falls in love with Juliet and she loves him back. Other than the obvious out there, violent conflict there are other conflicts at play as well internal conflict is present throughout the play and it's more I think it's more noticeable with Juliet when Juliet has to decide whether she will mourn Tybalt's death or be happy that Romeo is alive and well because she loves them both she does obviously choose Romeo in the end again we're going to detail that as she doubts the poison that the fry has given her she's not so sure it's going to kill her and we have that little moment and then in the orchard, she shows hesitation about whether not, whether Romeo loves her back and whether she should give up her heart so readily. Again, we will be detailing that, so please hang around. Another subtle instance of conflict then is fate versus free will. And you can't avoid fate in this play, as you well know, it is massive. Um, and fate is the idea that people's lives are controlled by a higher power, by the stars. But free will is the belief that the future is dependent on a person and their actions, so what we do. Now, all the way through the play, Romeo and Juliet allude and make references to the idea that they think fate is controlling them. Don't forget, Romeo has a vision about his death. Juliet does. Um, Romeo shouts, fortune's full, I defy, fortune's fool, I defy you stars. So they do um, make reference to it all the way through. And in this play, fate is cruel. We have the obvious moments where fate works against the lovers and the more subtle moments, one being Friar John and the letter. Again, we're going to come to that in more detail. A hugely obvious one as well then is Juliet and her father. So Act 3, Scene 5, this massive conflict she has with her dad about the arranged marriage to Paris, how she doesn't want to do it, is massive. Um, an obvious instance of conflict if you find yourself struggling in the exam. Again, we are going to detail that. So these are the things we're going to detail throughout this video. Please stick around. There will be a lot of detail. So pause as you need, make notes as you need. And obviously I hope this is going to be useful. So naturally we have to start with the prologue because it outlines and forewarns and foreshadows everything that is to come in the play really. So what I've done is I've took three key quotes that we might want to analyse if we get a question about conflict. So we've got ancient grudge, we've got civil blood makes civil hands unclean, we've got lovers take their life. Now obviously they all suggest physical conflict and physical violence and as the prologue is a form of dramatic irony the audience are forewarned about the rest of the play and therefore we get an idea that conflict is essential. Now obviously um, in preparation for analysing language in the exam, it's very simple. I would analyse the adjective ancient to show us that this feud has lasted years. It is something that is all has almost become a tra tradition for the families. It is also why they take it so seriously and why when Act 1, Scene 1 begins, it is so embedded within the families that even the servants uphold it and fight each other. Yes, you can analyse grudge because it shows shows us exactly um what's going to happen and what's going on between the families and what they think of each other if we you know if we hold a grudge against somebody uh, we dislike them for whatever reason and we can't seem to overcome that dislike and um, your civil blood makes civil hands unclean obviously we can mention blood here the noun blood shows us and forewarns us that there's going to be some fighting and as we rightly know the fighting is hugely important especially when we get to act three scene one uh, and lovers take their life. Again, we are forewarned about conflict, violence, all in the prologue. So don't forget, simple quotation for violence and conflict is ancient grudge. Civil blood makes civil hands unclean. 
And so the play opens with Act 1, Scene 1. And this is the first time we see physical conflict. So it's straight away. Again, if we're thinking about Shakespeare's structure and the way he's organised the play, the fact that it happens instantly sets up this conflict, the two families, the fact that Romeo and Juliet are destined to die because everything is working against them, the violence, the conflict, the feud, the fate. And the servants from the two households are having an argument because Samson says, I bite my thumb, sir, which is an ancient Italian insult. Now, as the two families already despise each other, this minor little insult starts a fight. So, because Sam, uh, this is exactly what happens, because Samson says, draw if you be men. And then a brawl breaks out. And we get the stage direction, they fight. So you've got your three quotations there. The speed at which the fighting starts shows the audience that a row and a fight and an argument can break out at any time. So again, look at those three quotations. I'm going to analyse, I bite my thumb soon now. But don't forget, you've got your stage directions, that there's a fight, a mass brawl, over something so simple as an insult. So Samson has no reason of his own insult to the Montague servants. He hasn't got an actual reason, a personal reason himself. And he's trying to cause trouble because his master, the Capulets, are feuding with the Montagues, as we rightly said, leads us back to the prologue, Ancient Grudge. And the irony here he, he is that Samson is too much of a coward to own up to the fact that he is the one who started it with the, the putting the thumb in his mouth because he knows that the law will blame him. And he says, will the, Lord, will the law be on my side if I see I? Now, Shakespeare's point here is that the feud and the fighting is childish and pointless and so immature that they would fight each other because someone is biting their thumb. And the fact that it runs so deep that the servants fight, just sh it shows us the severity of the grudge. Um, you, know, it's not, you know, it's not just Lord Montague and Lord Capulet fighting, it's everybody. It's, as I say, it's even the lowly servants, if you like. We can't avoid Tybalt when it comes to violence and conflict and in Act 1 scene 1 we see Tybalt for the first time. Now Tybalt enjoys the conflict, we know he's feisty, he gets described as fiery so that adjective again shows us his personality and to me he is the vehicle, he is the vehicle that carries the violence through the play, he's the antagonist so we can't avoid him. He fights in Act 1 scene 1, he tries to fight Romeo in Act 1 scene 5, he starts the fight in Act 3 scene 1 and kills Mercutio his first words foreshadow his one-dimensional character uh, and this status that he never changes. He's, he acts the same in every single scene. And we get, what art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio, look upon thy death. Now, straight away, please watch my Tibble's video if you need extra detail. He insults them by calling them heartless hinds, female deers. Now, insulting a man's masculinity in, in Elizabethan society was, uh, was massive. It was huge. Um, so when he does that, he sets up again a fight. Then he asks Benvolio to look at his death. So Tybalt isn't messing about here. He has one intention and that is to kill. And he carries that on later because his intention later on is to kill Romeo. Don't forget as well that Tybalt's name is also linked to the theme of conflict. The name Tybalt is from a folk tale about a fox who is cunning. And in the story, there is a cat called Tybalt. And this character is argumentative, looking for an argument. It's exactly what Tybalt's like and sly. Look how he kills Mercutio under Romeo's arm. Again, look at this quote. What drawn and talk of peace, I hate the word as I hate hell, all Montagues and thee. Haven't they, coward? Look at your repetition, repetition of hate here. He, as I said, this vehicle of he's going to carry on the feud, he carries on the conflict because he enjoys it. The fact that he hates peace sets Tybalt up as our anta antagonist, as the person that's almost personifying the violence throughout, um, throughout the play, as someone that is going to cause trouble for the lovers. Also in Act 1, we get the prince. Now, the prince is conflicted between law and mercy. So this is another instance of conflict. Again, if you need more detail, please check out my video on the prince. Now, he represents the voice of conflicted law. He attempts to be disciplined, but he's too extreme. Quote, your life shall be the forfeit of the peace. So in Act 1, Scene 1, when the brawling's going on, he is going to punish them by death. 
He has his own inner conflict, as I've just said, and he shouts at them that they're enemies to the peace and that they're rebellious subjects. So we have this idea that he really is protecting the law. But he almost goes, well, he does, he goes back on his word because when Romeo has killed Tybalt, he then exiles him. Immediately we do exile him. Now, that is not what he said. He said, your life shall pay the forfeit of the peace. So now he's gone from law, right, you're going to have to be killed and punished, to mercy, just exile him and banish him. And there, therefore the prince has his own conflict, which then is um, projected onto the society of Verona. Don't forget as well, the conflict becomes personal for the prince because he is related to Mercutio. The prince's language as well shows the conflict that he has between law and mercy when he talks about all, all are punished and uh, so, sorry when he says some are punished and some are pardoned well that's not fair yes in terms of law law should be equal for, for all so the prince also represents conflict but his is law versus mercy as i said please check out my video on the prince there where there's, where there's more detail so he himself is presenting another conflict for us and it's one within society now um, moving on to Act 1, Scene 5, which is when Romeo meets Juliet, when he gets to the Masquerade Ball. Now, the huge irony we must remember here is that Romeo has went into the ball because he knows Rosaline is there. Tybalt sees him and thinks that Romeo is there to mock them. Romeo isn't there it's because of Tybalt. It's not even, then it's not, they're not even linked. So again, we have this idea that fate and conflict are working against them. And we get this this bit by Tybalt. Fetch me my rapier, boy, what dares the slave come hither covered with an antic face to flee and scorn our solemnity. Now by the stock and honour of my kin to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. Now we've got the imperative fetch me my rapier, boy, this demanding, aggressive nature that Tybalt shows. He often speaks in imperatives. We get the fact that he's being quite insulting when he uses the word slave. To, to describe Romeo. And then obviously we get the theme of honour. He's defending, or so he says, the honour of the family, the honour of my kin. He's defending the Capulet name and by going to fight with Romeo. Lord Capulet obviously doesn't agree with that because Lord Capulet is the one that stops him. But that there's your instance of honour there. And then again, we get the same tibble from Act 1, Scene 1, hence me calling him one-dimensional. To strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. He's there his intention is to kill Romeo. So Lord Capulet prevents Tybalt from starting a fight. He says he's not going to make a mutiny among my guests. Tybalt responds with, I'll not endure him. And then he says, I will withdraw. But this intrusion shall now seeming sweet convert to bitterest gall. Look at that. Now, sh um, foreshadowing is working with dramatic irony he dramatic irony he because as an audience we know the prologue we know that what the prologue has stated about civil bloods making civil hands unclean about the star-crossed lovers taking their lives about the ancient grudge and this moment here tybalt seeing this warns and foreshadows the up-and-coming fight in act three scene one which is the turning point in the play and also here we have our intertwining themes Fate, violence and conflict are all tightly linked. It's almost like we can't have one without the other in this play. And this is a threat by Tybalt. Again, like I said earlier, the vehicle. He is the vehicle that carries the violence on and he takes it with him to Act 3, Scene 1. Look at convert to bitterest goal. Definitely analyse that in terms of your language. Look at bitterest. Yeah, and, and obviously what that shows us about him. So we're just going to move to Juliet now in Act 1, Scene 5, and internal conflict. So, obviously Juliet meets Romeo, they exchange the sonnet. Uh, when Juliet discovers the identity of Romeo, she's shocked and can't believe she loves someone who she is supposed to hate. And we get one of her famous lines, My only love sprung from my only hate. Very simple language to analyse in terms of the exam. Look at your juxtaposition of love and hate. Therein lies the conflict that Juliet faces, that she loves someone she's supposed to hate. She loves someone that the ancient grudge 
uh, suggests she should sh uh, she should hate the person that her family hates. So we have this conflict working internally and emotionally on Juliet's behalf. She also says that I must love a loathed enemy. So I've just put a quick explanation there. She uses the juxtaposition of love and hate, highlighting her inner turmoil, and also must indicates that she has no other choice. She loves Romeo and cannot change the fact this presents a conflict for Juliet because she can't change how she feels, despite knowing that she should. So again, now we've got the power of Juliet's love and this idea that she's conflicted between this love and her family. She's conflicted between this love and her father later on, and she's conflicted between this love um, and the feud. Interestingly, um, in the orchard, so when Romeo has snuck back in, Julia again shows the inter internal conflict, an emotional conflict that she feels. Feels, She says, I am too quickly won. Then she says, it is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden. So look at this. In the orchard, she seems slightly hesitant. She realises that this intense love that she holds for her enemy is dangerous. And we have this almost, as I say, hesitation. Look at, I am too quickly won this acknowledgement look at your adverb quickly she knows that she has fallen in love extremely quickly and i suppose this is uh, um this alludes to aristotle and the tragic hero doesn't it juliet is arguably a tragic heroine because she almost acts in a similar way to romeo which is in haste isn't it they fall in love very quickly and then we get the triple that we can analyze too rash too unadvised and too sudden you could analyse them as individual words if you like. Unadvised is an interesting one because it reminds us just how inexperienced she is. But obviously rash and sudden are similar in the, in the sense that, oh my God, what's going to happen? It's dangerous. I love my enemy. What happens if he doesn't hold the same um, intensity for me and the same desire and passion? So Juliet is working here with her own conflict. The fact that she has fallen in love with the enemy and the fact that she... Um, hesitates about this being quite dangerous if we just take a little pause here and look at something else that is a subtle conflict on Shakespeare's behalf and that is light and darkness so there's a conflict between light and darkness throughout the play Romeo compares Juliet to light all the way through so for instance she teaches the torches to burn bright she is the sun who can kill the envious moon and later in the scene her eyes are like the fairest stars in all the heaven she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in an Ethiop, or Ethiop's ear. Romeo is also compared to light. Juliet claims that if he dies, he should be cut in little stars and he will meet the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Like their love, darkness is associated with mystery. The daytime works against the lovers. At the end of their honeymoon night, they must part before light arrives so that he is not caught and killed. Because remember, after the wedding, the wedding night, he's banished. So he has to leave Verona. The night time and the dark is when we witness them at, uh, uh, witness the, their relationship blossom. They meet at night. The balcony scene is at night. The suicide is at night. They make love, obviously, at night. Their love blossoms at night. A time when they are away from the public, away from society. It also represents forbidden love and secrecy. So again, just this another subtle instance of Shakespeare's conflict here is the imagery of light versus darkness, daytime versus nighttime. The lovers not being forbidden to be together in the day and then flourishing in terms of their relationship at night. Um, Act 3, scene 1 comes around then. So Romeo has just married Juliet and we have Tybalt and the fight. So again, structure of the play, fate, violence, conflict, all intertwined to work against Romeo and Juliet. Tybalt believes Romeo has dishonoured the Capulet family, so we get honour again here by crashing the ball. So he's come for revenge. We get the code, boy, this shall not excuse the injuries that thou hast done me, therefore turn and draw. So look, boy, he's insulting Romeo again, um, insulting his masculinity. Look at turn and draw pretty much the tibble we've always had you know get your sword out and he can fight you and then we get i am for you and we get our stage directions he draws his sword 
So he continues with the fighting. He continues in the same vein as we've seen him in Act 1, Scene 1. And much like in Act 1, Scene 1, when he wanted to kill Benvolio, he is now wanting to kill Romeo because of honour. Okay? Now, Romeo here tries to stop the conflict because, obviously, he's married to Juliet and he gives us that speech about the, the Capulet name being as dear de as his own. Romeo draws his sword and he says, Draw Benvolio, beat down their weapons, gentlemen, for shame, forbear this outrage. Tybalt Mercutio, the prince expressly hath forbidden Banyan in the Verona streets. Hold Tybalt, good Mercutio. The problem we've got, though, as I've said a million times, I know it's getting repetitive, because all of these things are working against Romeo and Juliet, by thinking he's stopping the conflict, and when he says, I thought all for the best, Romeo makes it worse. Because when he steps in between Mercutio and Ben, uh, sorry, when he steps in between Mercutio and Tybalt, Tybalt kills Mercutio under his arm. So Shakespeare is warning us again, and warning Romeo, you can't avoid conflict, because it is working hand in hand with fate. Um, this moment as well, I suppose, just reminds us of what we were told earlier in the play. Mercutio in Act 3, Scene 1, gives us his most famous line, A Plague in Both Your Houses. And he cleverly points out the result of the conflict on the families, and it's that their households are now plagued. And we can analyse that in many different ways. They are plagued because the feud has ruined them. They are plagued because the feud is so deep that it runs through everybody, even to the servants. They are plagued because they almost can't relieve themselves of it until the deaths of Romeo and Juliet. And Plague, remember, is warning us about why the letter never reaches Romeo later on because of the plague that's in the village. So Plague is a good one to analyse. Don't forget, um, in Elizabethan society, there had been an outbreak of the plague. So people will have known about it and known its severity. Um, and also, in Elizabethan society, Plague was... The plague was associated with death. So we have Mercutio pointing out just how destructive the conflict is. Naturally, Juliet shows an internal conflict again after Romeo has killed Tybalt. So the love that was so blissful and so poignant and so powerful in Act 2 is tested in the worst of circumstances here. Juliet shows that she's brave, mature and loyal to Romeo. She initially criticises him for killing Tybalt. But then when she hears the nurse maligning him and calling him, mocking him, she regains control of herself and realises that her loyalty is with her husband. Initially she says this, I put your, trans your translation on the right. O serpent heart hid with a flowering face, did ever dragon keep so fair cave, beautiful tyrant, fiend, angelical, dove feathered raven, wolfish ravening lamb. I'm just going to stop there. Look at your juxtapositions to show the internal conflict that Juliet is feeling. The serpent versus the flower. Something innocent versus something sly. The tyrant versus the angel. Something beautiful versus a fiend. Uh, the dove, which is white, versus the raven, which is black. Your juxtapositions in Juliet's language shows how conflicted she is between... Romeo, her husband, and Tybalt, her cousin. Ultimately, though, as I said, after the nurse starts to um, insult Romeo or, or question Romeo, she defends him. And we get blistered be thy tongue for such a wish. He was not born to shame upon his brow. Shame is a shame to sit. For tis a throne where honour may be crowned. Sole monarch of the universal earth. Oh, what a beast was I to chide at him. So look at that. She says that Romeo deserves honour. Then she says that she's a beast because she was angry at him. So the internal and emotional conflict that Juliet f felt has been replaced with the defending of Romeo. Now we are approaching Act 3, Scene 5 and the massive instance of Juliet versus her father. So just a quick reminder of the context, patriarchal society. We have a society in which men are the leading figures and make the decisions. Men dominate and rule. A father had complete, complete control over the women in his family. Women, no voice in society. They were domestic. There was no jobs, no opportunities. They had to be their, obey their father and their husband and they weren't educated. So that there is setting up the shocking moment where Juliet defies her father. 
So she feels so strong that she defies her father um, when he wants her to marry Paris. But in that action, she learns the limit of her power, hence the conflict. And when she says, he shall not make me their joyful bride, Capulet is furious. Oh, I will drag thee there. Sorry, oh, I will drag thee on a hurdle thither. Hurdle was what they used to tie, like a wooden frame that they would tie traitors to to be punished. So that is a huge religious image there. This idea of a traitor um, being tied to a frame. And strong as she might be, she is a woman in a male-dominated world. And we know her father has the right to make her do as he wishes. And we get all of those quotations screamed at her during this mass conflict. Hang thee, young baggage, disobedient wretch. Get thee to church. Speak not, reply not. My fingers itch. Hang, beg, starve, die in the streets. You be mine, I give you to my friend. So look at all that for quick analysis in terms of conflict. You can do the adjective disobedient. You can do the imagery of baggage as if she's a burden weighing him down and he almost has to get rid of it. The fact that he wants her to die, that is how much Juliet is, is, is insulting her father and society because obviously that was the how society operated. Fathers decided that who their child daughter would marry. Don't forget the flip side of that is the bravery of Juliet within this conflict that she defies him. And look at I, you be mine, I give you to my friend this idea that she is in fact a possession. So it's an obvious moment of conflict in the play and you can analyse the language in it um, dead straightforward. Now, when we get Act 4, Scene 1, we now have a different conflict because now it is Romeo versus society and Romeo versus fate. So the friar obviously gives Juliet the potion, etc, etc. And, and he tells Juliet that. Shall Romeo by my letters know our drift, and thither shall come, and he and I shall watch thy waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee to Mantua. But unforeseen to the friar and Juliet is that poor Romeo doesn't get the letter. Remember, because Friar John can't get the letter there, because there is a plague running through the village. Hence Mercutio's famous words, a plague on both your houses. Romeo, on hearing that Juliet is dead, shouts, I defy you, stars. So he thinks he's going to rebel against the stars and against fate. The heavy irony here, guys, is that he's not. Fate, we know from the prologue, has already, um, it's already been destined or worked out that Romeo and Juliet were going to die and take their lives. So when he runs back to Verona and kills himself, it's actually not a defiance of the stars at all. It's exactly what was supposed to happen. Okay, my final points, because I've said quite a lot on conflict and no doubt you'll be bored. Um, so I've just got a couple of points to make to finish and then that'll be it. Um, the individual versus society. So Romeo and Juliet, as you know, involves the lovers struggling against the public um, and society because of their love. Um, and these obstacles that they face range from obvious things like the family to the less obvious like the law. Uh, the desire for public order, social importance that is placed on honour. Because remember, when I say social importance placed on honour, Romeo fighting Tybalt. And all of these things present conflict for Romeo and Juliet. The hate between their families and the emphasis placed on loyalty and honour combine to create a profound conflict. And they will rebel against it, don't they? They rebel against this conflict. Also, the patriarchal power structure where the father controls the action of all the family places Juliet in a vulnerable position because then Lord Capulet tries to arrange a marriage for her that she then has to rebel against. So she's working against family as well. We get subtle instances of religion. Religion demands priorities that Romeo and Juliet can't abide by because of their love. They think of each other in blasphemous terms. It's on my Romeo and Juliet video, so please watch that. In, it's got it in detail because of the way they address each other. When she says that he is the god of my idolatry and when he uses pilgrims and shrines to describe her, it defies religion, so they set up that conflict as well. And the, the fact that they kill each other at the end is, is unchristian-like for an Elizabethan society. 
And again, the importance of masculine honour forces Romeo to commit actions. He doesn't want to. He does not want to fight in Act A, Scene 1. But then, as I say, masculine honour means that he defends the fact that Mercutio is being killed. Social emphasis is placed on honour and it's so intense that he can't ignore it, even though he tries. It is possible to see Romeo and Juliet as a battle between the responsibilities and actions demanded by society and the individual. So what society wants and what Romeo and Juliet want are two very different things. And Romeo and Juliet's appreciation of night with its darkness and privacy shows that they want to escape the public world. They want to escape society and be. Okay. A lot of information there. And I do apologise that I'm losing my voice, so it's a bit gruffly. Um, I hope it's been useful. Massive good luck in your English literature exam. I hope it all goes well for everybody. Um, and thank you. Check out my channel if you need any of my other detail, detailed videos like The Prince, The Nurse, The Friar, uh, Romeo and Juliet, etc. Massive good luck.